Okay, and so now we will officially get started. Elaine Mills is a member of the 2012 Master Gardener training class whose primary interest is in sustainable gardening. She created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are now a popular resource on our website. She has spent eight years photographing native plants in public and private gardens and enjoys selecting pictures from her photo library to illustrate her talks, articles, and weekly educational posts for our group on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. In addition, she serves as one of the coordinators for the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden in Arlington. I am super pleased and excited to present Elaine Mills with Gardens That Educate and Inspire. Take it away, Elaine. Thank you very much, Nicole. And a big thank you also to Leslie, Betsy, and Jason who are helping behind the scenes. Welcome everyone to our next presentation in the Sustainable Landscaping series. Over the past uh, two years, most of the presentations that I've been giving for our public education via Zoom have focused on native plants and their use in home landscapes. Today, in recognition of National Gardening Week, I'm going to change the pace a little bit, and I'd like to introduce uh, you to a number of gardens in the Washington metropolitan area that were actually the location where many of those photos that I used in those earlier talks were taken. We'll begin with a tour of eight Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens. These are maintained by Master Gardeners in the Arlington Alexandria Unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension. And I'll be describing the features of each of the gardens, what makes them unique, and describing the various sustainable gardening practices that we employ there. On the handout that I've provided, you'll see links to related resources on the website for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. So even if you are attending this session from outside our immediate area, you'll find related plant lists, articles, and photo galleries that I hope you will find helpful and inspirational uh, for planning your own gardens. After taking a, a midway break for some questions, we'll continue with a quick look at uh, six public gardens in the DC area. And I'll be giving you some quick highlights of that and a few notes to help you plan visits. So let's begin right away, looking at our Master Gardener demonstration gardens. Uh, the first is the organic vegetable garden. This one is located the furthest north uh, up in North Arlington, Virginia, at Potomac Overlook Regional Park. This garden was begun in 2000, and there is a continuing collaboration with the park staff. The idea behind the garden is to demonstrate organic methods for vegetable gardening in our urban area, and they want to emphasize how you can preserve the natural environment while you're avoiding the use of pesticides. Here's a look at the garden uh, early this spring, and the main use is made of raised bed gardening. Here was a look just a few weeks ago, and uh, in the fall, you'll see yet different plantings. The garden emphasizes different aspects, such as winter sowing and interplanting. And if your gardening for vegetables is limited to a small space, they also demonstrate square foot gardening and container plantings. These were some early season tasks that I photographed, weeding, prepping the soil, propagating from seed, and of course, very carefully labeling your rows. And then just a few weeks ago, beginning with the thinning process. More recently, I've seen examples of planting vegetable starts and I saw how they were soaking some of those starts in fish emulsion and then adding alfalfa meal to provide extra nutrition for the young plants. You'll see great examples of how to decide for the proper planting depth and using different tools to give you correct spacing between the plants so they can grow in a healthy manner. The organic vegetable garden grows quite a mix of crops. You'll see greens and garlic that are overwintered. And then this whole range of plants that are grown either from seed or from uh, slips. Then uh, peppers, tomatoes, and eggplants are examples of, of species that are added as young vegetable starts. 
And the OVG also has uh, fruits, strawberries and blueberries, as well as asparagus and ostrich ferns. They are the only fern for which you can eat the uh, fiddleheads. The organic vegetable garden demonstrates lots of great watering techniques from a system of soaker hoses, the use of a rain barrel to capture water from the roof of a shed, and sometimes watering by hand is the best way to work, especially when you have newly planted rows of seeds. They also demonstrate different ways of protecting your plants. They have a wildlife, wildlife exclusion fence to keep out the deer, crop cages to keep out squirrels, and row covers for uh, insect pests. In addition, they uh, plant many flowers and even allow a few of the greens to go to flower in order to attract beneficial insects. And as careful as they are, there are challenges, unexpected challenges that come up in vegetable gardening. One example was a discovery just last week of allium leaf miner in the garlic. You also have to keep an eye out for diseases such as uh, Phytophthora that uh, occur when there's a, an overly great amount of moisture. It's not uh, flowing away properly from the roots of the plants. And they've also had to deal with invasive species. This plant here, marsh pennywort, was growing uh, quite abundantly in their pathways. And so they've been careful to remove that and put that directly into the trash. And another invader is the non-native jumping worm. Composting techniques, of course, are very important for building the soil when you're not going to be using a lot of chemicals. So they uh, demonstrate a three bin system. Uh, fall leaves are used for the so-called brown component and healthy vegetable trimmings are used for the green component. And their magic ingredient is uh, coffee grounds. They will also demonstrate uh, how to properly turn the components of the compost pile to make sure that there's the proper balance of air space and moisture. They have other uh, composting. For example, plants with weeds are completely separated out into a different compost pile away from the garden itself. They have long-term composting for, uh, for stems that take a, a longer time to break down. And then when all of this comes to the proper point, they will add the finished compost to their raised beds. They also have become quite expert at growing cover crops and using different mulching techniques. Uh, annual crimson clover is used to add nitrogen to the soil. And as it breaks down, then it's turned under to provide organic matter. Other examples are oats, rye, and field peas. They will add biomass and also prevent erosion from the beds over the winter. In some of the beds where they are, have not been using cover crops, they used heavy cardboard to suppress the weeds. And then a great example of their mulching is using pine needles, which are appropriate for acid-loving plants like blueberries. The organic vegetable garden does a great deal of harvesting for those in need in our community. And over the years, they've uh, gathered together hundreds of pounds of fresh produce delivered principally to the Arlington Food Assistance Center, but also other charitable organizations. They provide a great deal of educational information at the garden in multiple kiosks. You'll see uh, charts with planting dates, important information about how to uh, properly undertake crop rotation. There's very helpful signage about different uh, families of plants and even a little library for sharing books having to do with vegetable gardening. The OVG has multiple public events. Just this spring, they had Flora Fest. Despite the rain, they were able to do some seed planting for children. And every September, they hold Pepper Fest, where you'll get to have tastes of many sweet and hot peppers. I found this garden whimsy absolutely charming with uh, very creative bird houses, stained glass pieces, and a lovely fairy garden for children 
where the herbs become trees and shrubs for the little beings in that garden. You can get further information about the organic vegetable garden on the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website. I've provided links on your handout. So you'll see an article about various gardening challenges that they faced, some monthly essays from garden leaders, and very helpful fact sheets on their use of cover crops. They hold a Wednesday morning work parties, but you may also see master gardeners in the gardens on Saturdays doing some watering. And they uh, encourage you to visit at any time, but just to make sure to safely close the gate behind you. Moving a little further south uh, to the Bon Air Park, we see the Sunny Garden. This was created in 1990 and obviously mostly features perennials for the sun, but they also include some shade tolerant plants that uh, are now growing up under their large shade trees. And one of the leaders is, was the recipient of the Bill Thomas Park Volunteer Award in Arlington County. Beautiful American wisteria covers this arbor as you enter the garden. This particular garden is adjacent to the Bon Air Rose Garden, and it consists of large curving beds with linking pathways. Right at the front are some hell strips right next to the curb. These are hot, dry areas, uh, so you'll want to find species that are very uh, drought tolerant there. Uh, one example is Mexican feather grass. You'll also see the orange flowered native butterfly weed and threadleaf coreopsis, as well as geranium, blue star, and lyre leaf sage. And right at the front, you'll see examples of the signage that they use throughout the garden with both the common and scientific names of the plants. The sunny garden has colorful blooms throughout the season. In late winter, you'll see ephemerals in the shade, such as epimediums and Lenten roses. And then come spring, wild indigo, iris, peonies, mallow, poppies, and love in a mist. In summertime, very colorful with larkspur, many species of daylilies, salvias, globe thistle, and stunning specimen plants such as Don Humphrey hibiscus. A new addition to the garden are these lovely handmade trellis towers for vines. The vine uh, near to us here in the picture is covered with white flowered mandevilla and the one in the distance has a native clematis and uh, this is surrounded by a drought tolerant culinary and medicinal herb garden. Moving into fall, you'll see abundant uh, plants uh, native plants, goldenrod, asters, black-eyed Susans, joe pieweed, and switchgrass, which provide late season nectar and pollen for our pollinators. And the garden even has winter interest with lingering foliage and seed heads that provide food and cover for wildlife. They've recently expanded the garden and they now have newly planted native trees such as sweet bay magnolia and sourwood, as well as native shrubs, father gilla, and sweet pepper bush. The Sunny Garden is famous for demonstrating various propagation techniques. And starting very early in the spring, they'll begin scouting out the garden and deciding which perennials they want to dig up. They have a, a longtime master gardener expert who will help divide up the plants and then teams of master gardeners will help pot them up. And this will be the start of a plant nursery of carefully labeled plants that will then be uh, carried on to our big uh, contribution for our booth at uh, the Green Spring plant sale held in May. There are resources on the Sunny Garden on the Master Gardener website. You can see articles on the history and special features of the garden, as well as a lovely seasonal slideshow. You'll find Master Gardeners in that garden on alternating Saturdays and Monday mornings for their work parties. 
And I wanted to mention that there will be this weekend an open house from one to three. Another garden uh, in the Bonaire Park is the Quarry Shade Garden, just a little further down the path in the woods. This is the oldest of our demonstration gardens created in 1989 on the site of an old unused rock quarry. It's dedicated to master gardener Alice Nicholson, who did her training way back in 1980 and was one of the founding members of our nonprofit group, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. This garden uh, obviously has many plants native to the Eastern US and some well-adapted non-invasive exotics. And the leaders of this garden were also recipients of the Bill Thomas Park Volunteer Award. This is the smallest of our demonstration gardens measuring only 40 by 30 feet. Uh, it is very lovely with terraces and paths in that quarry. And this garden has been certified as a National Wildlife Federation Backyard Wildlife Habitat. In the garden, you'll see native understory trees such as Eastern Redbud, American Holly, American Hornbeam, and Fringe Tree with its beautiful white flowers. Various shrubs such as Andromeda, our native Pinkster Bloom Azalea, and common yucca. There are of many spring ephemerals. These non-native plants, Lenten rose, snowdrops, and starflower, and native species, including bellwort, celandine poppy, and Virginia bluebells. The blooming continues with various native woodland plants, such as Eastern columbine, golden ragwort, Jacob's Ladder, and then a little later, Spiderwort, Turtlehead, St. John's Wort, and in the fall, Blue-Stemmed Goldenrod. Of course, uh, growing in the shade, there's a lot of emphasis on growing plants with interesting foliage, and there are many ferns in this garden. Uh, you can see all the types listed here. The tallest is the one in the center of the royal fern. There is the non-native attractive painted fern. Uh, evergreen ferns include Christmas and leatherwood fern. And there's uh, ostrich, interrupted, and hay-scented fern as well. Other plants for interesting foliage are uh, non-native evergold sedge and hostas. You'll see examples of many native ground covers in this garden. All of them have attractive flowers, but the nice thing is that they have lingering foliage with different textures that will cover the ground in a really attractive way. Wild stone crop is a, a succulent plant. Robin's plantain has a rather fuzzy foliage. Golden ragwort, white wood aster, and Allegheny spurge are pretty much uh, semi-evergreen in our region. Appalachian sedge, of course, has a more grass-like look. Foam flower is attractive with the red venation, and wild ginger has lovely satiny leaves. You can always count on uh, volunteering violets. Those are beneficial uh, as host plants for our fritillary butterflies, and moss phlox adds a delicate feathery touch. Uh, the leaders provide a lot of education in the garden. Uh, they, you'll find a kiosk there with brochures that have a plant list and tips on shade gardening. And like the sunny garden, they have signage with both the common and scientific names of the plants. As far as resources on the website, you'll see an article on the history of the garden, a slideshow of the garden through the seasons, and very interesting essays on various shade garden plants. The shade garden has work parties on alternating Thursdays and Saturdays, and they will also be having a, the joint open house this coming weekend. I'm proud to be one of the coordinators at Glen Carlin Library. This surrounds the branch of the Glen Carlin Library in Arlington, Virginia. This was begun as an Eagle Scout project in the 1990s and was rejuvenated by a 
pair of master gardeners who are Glen Carlin neighborhood residents. And then it came under the aegis of uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension as a demonstration garden in 2005. The idea behind our garden is to be a model of the of botanical diversity with various themed areas. And we have a brochure that indicates all the various garden rooms that completely surround the library. Unlike the other demonstration gardens, we have quite a, a great deal of built environment. Uh, there is a brick patio with many benches for seating. Uh, there you'll see seasonal container plantings. And we have a nod to our library location with planters on a library cart. Many of our visitors enjoy a seating in our gazebo where you can have an excellent view of our sizable herb garden. It's divided into four sections with herbs for culinary uses, fragrance, medicinal uses, and herbs with literary references. Among our themed gardens are the exotics garden at the front with colorful canna, celosia, bananas, and pineapple lily. We also have an Asian garden along one entire side of the library. Uh, it has a mondo grass river surrounding two large rocks, various low growing plants, familiar Asian big leaf hydrangea, these other uh, shrubs of Asian background, and then these colorful uh, shrubs, beauty berry, Japanese beauty berry, witch hazel, and camellia. And we are now replacing what had been a, a border of invasive liriope with sweet box. We have a great focus on native plants at this garden, particularly in this shady part of the garden. And for example, you'll see cardinal flower and alum root, ferns like wood fern and maidenhair fern, these interesting sedges, gray sedge and plant and leaf sedge, flowering shrubs like spice bush and sweet pepper bush, and shrubs that have wonderful uh, fruit for our birds the native beauty berry and red chokeberry. We also have a big emphasis on uh, education for the public on how to create habitat for wildlife. Some of our interns back from the class of 2018 created a dedicated pollinator garden with accompanying uh, helpful handouts. And these are located along with other materials such as the uh, tried and true fact sheets that uh, Nicole mentioned in our education box. And we also provide very detailed signage with not just the uh, common and scientific names of the plants, but a lot of details on how to grow them. We're proud to ha have uh, several beds of certified Monarch Way Station, and we've also received certification through the National Wildlife Federation and the Audubon at Home Wildlife Sanctuary Program. Another focus for us is education on climate conscious gardening. And one example of that is our use of cisterns, hand watering and soaker hoses to use water responsibly. We have water wise plantings in our parking lot area with uh, drought tolerant plants shown here. And we also even feature some turf alternatives, a type of native grass. We've created signage and uh, some videos done by last year's Master Gardener interns. And we have a helpful uh, climate conscious gardening checklist. Glen Carlin Garden has two major uh, educational events each year. Uh, in the spring, we have our spring celebration and plant sale. And then in September, we have Autumn Fest where herbal treats and beverages are created using herbs from our herb garden. We always have three workshops. The examples uh, shown here are for a tool, shop, uh, tool sharpening event and uh, a demonstration on flower arranging. And we have opportunities for visitors to do sachet making with our herbs. Resources on the MGNB website include articles with further details and a slideshow, essays on gardening through the seasons, and you'll see us on uh, Sundays, alternating Sundays and Mondays in the morning 
now in the hot season uh, at our work parties. Additionally, we have a series of short videos, uh, both on the website and on the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia YouTube channel. Uh, over this past winter, we created some short videos that we term Beautiful Native Plant Series, and we also have instructional videos. Moving uh, further south at our Fairlington Community Center headquarters, you'll find the Tribute Garden. This honors the work of master gardeners past, present, and future. It includes a bench for rest and reflection, and the plants highlight native species that will thrive in dry urban conditions. There are two native trees that anchor the garden, the American hornbeam, that's a very climate adaptable native tree, and willow oak, which is tolerant of tough urban conditions. You'll see compact cultivars of native shrubs, the Little Henry cultivar of sweet, uh, Virginia Sweet Spire, Dwarf Father Gilla, the diminutive hummingbird cultivar of Summer Sweet, and the paired female berry poppins and Mr. Poppins winter berry plants. There are perennials for seasonal color, starting with spring tulips, then later sun drops and beard tongue. In the summer, you'll see this purple coneflower and in the fall, New England aster. There are great examples of drought tolerant grasses and ground cover such as little blue stem, wild stone crop and field pussy toes. Also at Fairlington in the back courtyard is the small space garden. This garden focuses on plantings that are appropriate for balconies, patios, and containers, and it showcases both edibles and native plants for small spaces. At the very front of the garden, just outside the fenced in area, you'll see a, a newly planted area with native plants in a formal foundation pet bed. The idea here is to demonstrate that although many people think of native plants as growing in a somewhat more uh, wild and abundant manner, that you can also use them in a more traditional symmetrical design that would be especially useful should you only have a small space. Uh, the plants there, there are three service berry trees with their lovely spring blossoms. You'll see blue flag iris. And these are non-native strawberries here, but they have recently been replaced with the uh, native strawberry as a ground cover in the front. There's both Christmas fern and plant and leaf sedge as ground cover plants. Little blue stem will be a grass coming along before too long. And they also have shrubs of St. John's wort. To demonstrate the the growing of vegetables, they make use of two raised beds. And here they'll use tre trellises and cages to, to help control their growth. You'll also see the use of flowers to attract pollinators. In a second bed, they have PVC hoops uh, that will allow them to put up a protection for growing crops uh, in the cooler weather. And then they have this wire arch to help train vining plants. There are multiple examples of how to grow plants in containers. They demonstrate how to combine edibles and ornamentals in a single garden bed. Spreading mint is controlled in a container and brown turkey fig, which would grow to be quite a large tree, is trained to grow somewhat flat as an espalier on this fence area. Strawberry plants are also used here as an attractive ground cover, and you'll see many herbs and peppers combined with native perennial flowering plants. The small space garden also uh, demonstrates the use of uh, small native fruit and nut trees. The examples are American hazelnut and American plum, which will uh, bear nuts and fruit uh, in not too many years. Another service berry is located in the courtyard itself, and that bears fruit. 
And then right in front of this native dogwood is a, a there are actually several pawpaw trees. You need to have several to get the fruiting. Uh, this is the largest uh, of the native fruits that's born. The small space garden is the first of the gardens to uh, be coming up with garden designs that can actually be replicated by members of the public. This was a bed that I was asked to design. It only measures about 18 inches wide. It's about 20 feet long. And uh, shown here is a lovely plan that was created by one of our newly certified master gardeners to demonstrate exactly which flowers uh, can be planted in what manner should you want to replicate all or are part of this design. This garden also has some really attractive artistic touches with this recycled pottery and the charming uh, morel uh, mushroom uh, hose guide. The small space garden demonstrates uh, ecological gardening practices, such as the use of a cistern for watering needs, growing larval host plants for the caterpillar generation of our butterflies and moths, uh, providing habitat for nesting bees, such as leaving stems for overwintering. And we were excited to note that some leaves of uh, our perennial plants were being used in a very productive manner to line the nests of uh, leafcutter bees. Small Space Garden has a big emphasis on educational outreach. They are uh, located uh, right next to the farmer's market so they, uh, that's held at Fairlington. So they draw quite a crowd for their weekly plant clinic. They also have uh, occasional events for adults. This was a winter tree walk. And uh, every month they have uh, very uh, colorful activities for children. Uh, this picture shows how they were uh, telling youngsters about monarch butterflies. They had seed planting and then over to the bottom right, they recently showed how to plant a pizza pot garden. Resources on the MGNV website for both of the Fairlington Gardens include an article on the Tribute Garden and a plant list, and then details on small space gardening techniques, as well as the garden plans that I mentioned. I believe there are now three of them. The, uh, these two gardens hold their work parties on Sunday mornings. Uh, there's also the associated plant clinic that's uh, co-located with the Fairlington Farmers Market. And moving further south into Alexandria, we come to Simpson Park Garden, which is located in the Del Rey area adjacent to the YMCA. There was a grant uh, provided for this garden project back in 1991, and it was installed in various stages through 1997. It uh, displays a diverse range of plants uh, with best horticultural practices, attracting pollinators, conserving water, and thoughtful landscape design. At the very front of the garden, uh, just as you drive in, you'll see their waterwise garden, which is intended with, uh, to demonstrate low maintenance planting for exposed dry areas. And there you'll see drought tolerant plants, such as these salvias and multiple juniper species. There's a rich variety of plants for seasonal color, Mexican feather grass, this yellow flowered yarrow, charming marguerite daisies, and then these lovely flowers, fern leaf dropwort. This was a new species uh, unfamiliar to me, uh, ice plant, allium, and then this tamarisk, the tree that you see at the back is in full bloom with its beautiful pink blossoms uh, this week. Simpson Garden uh, is uh, comprised of 13 themed garden beds. And what makes them different from every other garden is that this garden was actually established on an old road and parking lot services. And that means that they only have about 18 inches of soil for growing all of their plants. One very notable garden at the front is the Tufa Garden, which has uh, rocks that were a gift from the US Botanic Garden. This type of rock uh, allows for plants that are suitable for rock gardens, such as alpine plants and sedums. 
and nearby you'll also see the flagstone garden which demonstrates the use of different hardscape materials that you might want to use in your own garden. There's a great emphasis in, uh, at Simpson for support of wildlife. One major example is their pollinator garden, which has uh, plants for providing pollen and nectar, as well as serving as host plants for butterflies and moths. And some examples of those plants are milkweed and pawpaw. And they also show how you can provide habitat for overwintering insects by retaining stems of, of perennials. They're also uh, building up a butterfly soak area that's in the works and there will be native plants, uh, particularly locally native plants added to that bed. And uh, the leaders are very proud to have multiple wildlife sanctuary certifications. The big berm is the largest feature in this garden. In the spring, you'll see iris, blue wild indigo, roses, beard tongue and geraniums in these lovely pastel colors. And then the berm takes on bright colors in the summer with cup plant, shasta daisies, daylilies, red hot pokers, and gladiolus. Simpson has quite a few specimen trees and there's actually a cluster of several black pines and they uh, have a dwarf Lebanon's Lebanon cedar beneath them. Uh, Non-native species also include dragon's claw willow and golden larch. And there are several native species of trees, including Eastern red cedar, Hercules club, and the Princess Diana cultivar of service berry. Among the other themed gardens are the shade garden with all of these native plants and a lovely scented garden at the front where you'll see plants with both fragrant flowers and foliage. Some examples I recently photographed there were pinks, mountain mint. There are many herbs such as rosemary and many charming bulbs as well in the spring. Continuing with uh, more themed gardens, the golden larch bed benefited from the removal of an overgrown arborvitae tree, and that allowed the rejuvenation of uh, three baptisia plants in a purple, yellow, and this uh, brownish pink. And they've also been pointedly adding new plants, such as sweet pepper bush and dog hobble, two native shrubs, and Allegheny spurge and rose verbena as their ground cover plants. In the Princess Diana bed, centered with their uh, service berry tree, they have uh, examples of how trees can provide food and shelter, and fountains and bee boxes and bird houses also provide support for their wildlife. There were many species of uh, spiderwort in a whole range of colors in that bed this spring. Simpson has many educational events. Just a few examples from this spring include uh, a, a seed project for Earth Day, seed planting for Healthy Kids Day in Alexandria. And I also want to point out that they have weekly public ed days. They call these Tuesdays at 10, and these are associated with their Tuesday morning work parties in the garden. There are multiple resources on Simpson at uh, the website. You'll learn some fast facts on some really unusual plants. And there are not one, but five separate photo galleries showing you all of the plants in the various beds of this extensive garden. And the garden coordinators encourage you to visit them on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings for their work parties. And uh, the most recently uh, created garden for us as a demonstration garden is the pollinator garden at the Buddy Ford Nature Center in Alexandria. This is a joint project of master gardeners and the Arlington Regional Master Naturalists. And it supports the work of the Nature Center. They were asked to revitalize a hillside garden of native plants that are local to the area. This had become overgrown. So they are going through the process of restoring it. And the initial work 
obviously started with the removal of invasive plants and many weeds, such as porcelain berry and winter creeper. They've gone about creating paths and they are slowly adding a variety of native trees, such as spice bush, eastern red cedar, and crab apples, as well as shrubs like blueberry and various perennials. I took this photograph just a few days ago. This shows recent work. They're actually creating a, a terrace to help control erosion. And they are now beginning to see how some of those beneficial native plants are emerging from the seed bank. And uh, these are the plants that were intended to be there from the outset. And they include bottle brush grass, sun drops, and upland ironweed. The pollinator garden is intended to uh, enrich the education opportunities at the nature center. And they do that by demonstrating the use of composters and rain barrels on the deck of the nature center. They also grow a wide variety of plants. You can see them in planters there. They have herb plants for making beverages and they also grow plants that will actually be used for feeding some of the animals in the nature center. On the website, you can see an article on the project and watch a video that's describing the work. Uh, they have Saturday morning work parties and they would welcome you visiting there. And you can also attend nature center programs. They'll be helping to participate in those. The gardens that I've been describing are designed and then re-envisioned over time by small teams of uh, coordinators who not only work in the gardens, but spend countless hours behind the scenes, uh, developing plant lists, creating brochures, and planning all kinds of educational events to take advantage of the continuing education that they themselves participate in. Then these leaders are supported by many volunteers. Uh, interns begin their work in these gardens, and then as they become certified, many of them become uh, regular participants, regular volunteers uh, over a long period of time. We hear uh, from visitors how much they value the beauty and the educational aspects of these demonstration gardens. Some folks take walks there every day with their young children and their dogs, and we've learned that others like to spend time in the gardens, in the peaceful atmosphere there. They may bring a book, uh, a musical instrument, their lunch, or even a yoga mat. And we hope that those of you who are within driving distance will come and visit us at our demonstration gardens. Uh, should you find Master Gardeners at work, uh, we will be happy to lead tours and answer any of your gardening questions. And now, Nicole, I'd be happy to answer any general questions about the gardens. There we are. Yes, uh, Elaine, we do have a few questions here. Um, I've, just, I've been enjoying all of your wonderful photos. Even, even when you're there in person, it's nice to just sit back and watch all of these. Um, but yes, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one um, relates to the um, OBG. Yes. And it's about uh, the ostrich fern. And uh, you mentioned, I believe, that it's the only fiddlehead that is edible. And one of the questions wanted to make sure if that was correct or not about, about the ostrich fern. Yes. At, at one point, uh, a number of fiddleheads of different native ferns were considered to be edible. But studies have shown that there are some carcinogenic components in some of the other fiddleheads. So at this point in time, the fiddleheads of the native ostrich fern are the only ones that are considered to be edible. And they have to be um, eaten at a very specific point in time and prepared in the proper manner. Thank you. Um, and then we had another question that uh, relates to Sunny Garden and it's with Joe Pieweed and whether it is too late to cut, pack, cut back Joe Pieweed that's already three feet tall. No, um, our extension agent, uh, Kirsten Conrad, just uh, had a very interesting uh, presentation, I guess it was last week, called uh, the Chelsea Chop. 
that is a reference to the kind of trimming back that you can do of perennials. And the allusion is to the Chelsea Flower Show in England. That's held uh, around late May or early June. And that can be a time that you can do some cutting back. I actually begin cutting back my tall native plants like uh, Joe Pieweed, Ironweed, uh, New England Aster, I'll, I'll begin cutting those back maybe even in May, but they can be actually trimmed back at several points. You can cut back as much as a third to one half of the plant uh, before it sets uh, flower. And we usually refer to the 4th of July as a convenient date to remember as the cutoff point. If you were to be trying to take off massive amounts of plant at that point, uh, they, they wouldn't flower. But by doing that pruning back, you can get the plants to be more under control. They won't be so leggy. They won't need to be staked. They won't be beaten down by some of the heavy rain events that we have. And uh, Kirsten mentions that uh, the flowers will be more abundant because they're branching out, sending out extra stems. The flowers will sometimes be a little bit smaller. Great. great. Um, and then we have another question about solarizing a yard or mm -hmm. a plot. Um, in preparation for a pollinator installation. Um, have, do you have, have we done it? I don't know if we've done this in any of the gardens. Do you have experience with this or? I don't have experience it? myself, but one uh, of our presentations, um, it's called, um, let's see, it's, uh, I guess we can look for, we can look for the correct listing and put that in the chat box. It's, uh, it's showing from ground to garden, essentially. It's a presentation by one of our master gardeners, Becky Halby, who talks about how you can take an area that just either had lawn or weeds and you can begin covering it over. Uh, part of, of what's done with that is what's referred to as a lasagna method where you're using a combination of, um, of materials such as, as cardboard and, and heavy mulch. Sometimes plastic is put down and that solarizing process is used in order to try to kill the, what, the seeds that are in the weed bank and, and then be able to plant. So that is one example of, of a presentation that you might look for in, uh, on our website in the Master Gardener virtual classroom that talks a little bit about that process. Um, oh, and then two more questions just uh, popped out, uh, popped in about uh, yarrow and whether you can use the Chelsea chop on yarrow right now. Uh, yes, I would think so. Mm -hmm. yes. um, okay, so I think we're set for questions. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Now I'd like to move on and introduce you to a number of public gardens in the Washington metropolitan area. The first are gardens in Northern Virginia. And I realize that there are many gardens in our region. These particular ones, the ones that I'm showing, are ones that I visited over the past eight, nine, 10 years as a, a master gardener, uh, because I was looking especially for, uh, for opportunities to photograph native plants as they were going through different stages of growth. But I'll be describing many other types of interesting features in these gardens in, in addition to that. So the first is a little known native plant garden that's tucked right behind the Nature Conservancy headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. This is only a, a half acre. It's a little walled in garden. You might not even realize it's it there but it has over 100 species of native plants. And the idea behind this was to promote the greater use of native plants, both in home gardening and commercial landscaping. And the public is welcome to come in and stroll and sit at any time. Very quiet, uh, peaceful refuge. They have seasonal plant lists in their box there on this post, and you're welcome to take those away for your own use. In this garden, uh, you'll see beautiful flowering beginning in the spring with eastern red bud, dogwood, and sassafras. And then these lovely uh, plants, the golden ragwort and dwarf crested iris that serve as ground covers and high bush blueberry. But there's interest throughout the entire growing season. You'll see wild hydrangea and nodding onion in the spring. 
uh, New York ironweed and black-eyed Susan getting on into the later part of the summer. And then in the fall, staghorn sumac, which turns such a brilliant color, beautiful smooth aster and various native grasses. This garden illustrates the landscape use of native plants. There are some specimen trees. This particular one is a uh, black, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, black gum. They have vines on large arbors, shrubs in hedges, native ground covers, and native plants used as edging plants. The next garden is Green Spring Gardens located in Alexandria, Virginia. This uh, was first created through the donation to Fairfax County of land owned previously by the Strait family. And now the park consists of 31 acres with both the historic house that's been there for quite some time and the surrounding grounds. And the focus of this garden, which has just celebrated recently its 50th anniversary, is practical horticultural techniques for home gardens in our region. This is a look at the house. It dates from the colonial period, but was renovated by the Strait family in 1942. And the garden surrounding this house was designed by Beatrix Ferrand. And she was an American landscape architect who worked from the late 1800s to the 1950s, the only woman among 11 founding members of the American Society of Landscape Architects. She's been, uh, she was commissioned over the years to design some 110 gardens for private residences, estates, public parks, and college campuses, including Princeton and Yale. And locally, she's known for her work uh, at Dumbarton Oaks. Anyway, behind the historic house, she created this lawn that was enclosed by a crescent-shaped boxwood hedge on top of a stone wall. And you can see it from this photo in 1944, very clearly that semicircle of the hedge. This is a look at the house in a present day. And this is now the site for various presentations, tours, and teas. Green Spring Gardens has a very attractive horticulture center with a large library. It isn't a lending library, but you're welcome to use the large collection of books there. They have a rotating art shows and a very attractive gift shop with garden related uh, puzzles, t-shirts, uh, books, you name it. Uh, adjacent to that is a glass house with orchids, tropicals, cacti, and succulents. And next to that is the uh, Garden Gate plant shop. This is a uh, run by frogs, friends of Green Spring Gardens, and the money brought through the sale of plants helps to fund the, the gardens. Here's a look at the map. You can see the historic house in the upper corner and the horticult horticulture center down toward the lower right. Where the uh, first arrow is with the circular drive is a very attractive rock garden. And at the second arrow to the left is a gazebo with a patio area. This is a site for some uh, concerts and various activities in the spring and summer months. You'll see a central lawn that's completely surrounded by that large circular path. And as you proceed around the path, you'll see landscaped flower beds, a wildlife garden, a townhouse garden uh, demonstrating, like our small space garden, how to use uh, plants in a small space, and an edible plants garden. And then moving away from that central area, there is a trail through a large forested area where you'll see native shrubs and wildflowers. And as you circle around, you'll come to a pond with a gazebo and demonstrations of wetland plants and trees. There's bright color in the garden throughout the year from winter blooms through spring per perennials and flowering shrubs. And in the summer, you'll see bulbs, uh, colorful grasses and tropicals. Later in the season, there are uh, attractive grass seed heads, fall foliage, fruiting shrubs, and this uh, nationally recognized collection of 270 witch hazel plants, both native and non-native. 
Also in Virginia, I highly recommend visits to Meadowlark Botanical Gardens. They're located in Vienna, Virginia, not too far from the Wolf Trap Center for the Performing Arts. The uh, grounds were originally part of a 74 acre farm that was donated by environmentalist Gardner Means and his wife, Carolyn Ware. And the, uh, an adjoining parcel was purchased, which now amounts to a 95 acre public garden. This consists of numerous planted beds, three lakes, and various uh, special plant collections that are all linked by multiple walking paths. Now, this is the only one of the gardens I'm mentioning that has an entrance fee. All of the others are completely free and open to the public. Um, when I first gave this presentation, it was for the 55 plus garden club. So I listed that $3 entrance fee. Uh, and I failed to uh, add on your handout that it, uh, there is a $6 charge for anyone ranging in age from 18 to 54. This, uh, in, to my mind, is a very reasonable charge. It's a very large garden, beautifully landscaped. And in fact, I have gone on and purchased an annual pass every year because there are so many things to, to see and interest throughout the seasons. You could go many, many times during the course of one year. The uh, entrance fee is only char uh, charged between March and November. It's completely free to uh, visit the garden in the winter months. Meadowlark Gardens is famous for its panoramic views. Uh, you can view them from gazebos and benches that are established uh, throughout the garden, dozens of benches for rest and contemplation. There's interest through the seasons, uh, starting with Japanese cherry trees in the early spring, banks covered in daylilies and peonies later, lush summer plantings. In the fall, you'll have the beauty of the grasses and fall foliage. And even in the winter, there's interest with a large collection of evergreens. Meadowlark is known for its winter walk of lights. The first of the collections I'd like to mention is the Virginia Native Tree Collection. And you'll see small uh, understory plants such as flowering dogwood and sweet bay magnolia, as well as uh, canopy trees like the shagbark hickory and American sycamore. Another important collection is in the Virginia native wetland that surrounds one of the three lakes, Lake Lena. And there you'll see bald cypress, swamp rose mallow, as well as Joe pieweed and horsetails, among other native species. A third collection, very extensive going down through the woodland, is referred to as the Potomac Valley native plant collection. And there you'll see numerous wildflowers and ferns, perennials, and shrubs. One very interesting garden unique to Meadowlark is uh, the Korean Bell Garden. And this was uh, originated with support from the Korean American Cultural Committee. And the main feature of this garden is this traditional wooden pavilion. Inside that pavilion is a three-ton bell referred to as the Bell of Peace and Harmony. And on that bell are engraved the crane and rose of Sharon, which are native to Korea, and the cardinal and dogwood, which are the native uh, bird and tree for Virginia. You'll also see on the various buildings in the garden, uh, decorative walls with uh, various representations of longevity. And there's interesting statues as well as native shrubs and trees from Korea. Moving on to public gardens in Washington, DC, the US Botanic Garden, which uh, just celebrated its 200th anniversary two years ago, located uh, in Washington on Maryland Avenue. The idea for this garden originated with George Washington, who had a vision for a botanic garden, and he requested space for that in his plans uh, for the new capital city in 1796. He was further supported by presidents uh, Jefferson and Madison, 
And so they recognized the scientific value and of plants and they assisted in the creation. So this uh, garden was established officially by Congress in 1820. Of course, it demonstrates the importance of plants and it does that by maintaining a permanent living collection of over 12,000 plants that are on display. In addition, they have a 25 acre production facility with many more plants that are, are brought out from time to time for various seasonal displays. Here's a look at the conservatory when it was first built in 1865 at the foot of Capitol Hill. And then this is a look at the more recent building. I believe uh, the ground, uh, the foundation stone was laid in the 1930s. Then across the street from the main garden is uh, Bartholdi Fountain. And this was sculpted by uh, the artist Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi. He is also the sculptor for the famous Statue of Liberty. This particular fountain referred to as the Fountain of Light and Water was unveiled in 1876 at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. And it was brought to Washington DC and it is now the centerpiece of this garden across uh, the street. More recently, the Outdoor National Garden was created. And that consists of multiple thematic gardens. I've used the lettering to, uh, to correlate to the different uh, colored areas you see on the map, a rose garden, butterfly garden, water garden, and regional garden. And these are referred to as a living laboratory for ecologically sound gardening practices. The Rose Garden showcases roses that thrive in our mid-Atlantic region, and they really want to emphasize that these can be grown with organic methods. And you'll see many classes of roses from little tiny fairy roses to uh, tall shrub roses in, arranged in octagonal beds. The Butterfly Garden demonstrates both with planting and educational materials how gardens support our pollinators. Uh, unfortunately, the First Lady's Water Garden didn't have any water the day that I took this photo, but it honors the unsung contributions of our president's wives. My favorite part and the largest part uh, of the National Garden is the Regional Garden. And this features the beauty of our region's native flora. These uh, plants are arranged from ground covers, grasses, perennials, shrubs, and trees. They're all arranged in beautiful landscaped beds, wonderfully uh, inspirational. Across the street at Bartholdi Park, uh, back in 2016, there was a huge renovation project which really wants to uh, showcase sustainable landscaping. And you'll even see examples of very ornamental vegetable gardening. Moving on to the US National Arboretum. This is on New York Avenue in DC. This was established by Congress in 1927 and it really has a dual purpose. It's considered to be a living museum to preserve the genetic diversity of already existing species. But scientists are also working to develop new cultivars for the horticulture industry. It consists of 446 acres that are organized into different collections and gardens. There's an administration building. Uh, it now has renovated pools with uh, aquatic plants and, and koi. Uh, this is the center for rotating exhibits and classes. And uh, in the past, it's been the location for their annual native plant symposium, the LAR Symposium. They have a very attractive herb garden. It's the largest in the United States. And this was given as a gift from the Herb Society of America. It consists of four rooms with seasonally changing plants. There is a knot garden, which you see pictured here. There's also a rose garden with 100 types of roses and uh, themed gardens that show the importance of plants in humans' lives. One of my favorite areas of the Arboretum is the National Bonsai and Penjing Museum, which has multiple pavilions and meditative gardens. They have uh, 300 specimens showing both the Chinese and uh, Japanese methods of training plants into miniature landscapes. And the oldest of the plants in training has uh, been 
going through that process since 1625. Looking at some of the collections, the Asian collection especially features winter and spring blooming plants, the camellias, witch hazels, and apricots. They are arranged in 13 acres of very dramatic landscapes. Uh, you would want to spend a, a good hour visiting just this one section of the Arboretum. Uh, uh, a word of alert, it's located on steeply sloping banks. So anyone with handicap issues, this would, would be kind of a challenge to see all of that. The Azalea Garden features thousands of shrubs. They are located uh, on rustic uh, woodland trails. And many of them are cultivars that were developed in breeding by the former Arboretum director, Benjamin Morrison. They bloom over a wide period of time, but the peak bloom is said to be mid-April to May. The boxwood collection has 180 species of boxwood, both straight species and cultivars, and they are enlivened by interplanting of various perennials. Uh, through the seasons, you'll see daffodils, peonies, and daylilies, and there are plans to add herbs and grasses to expand the seasonal interest. The conifer collection is based largely on a plants that were donated by William Gotelli, who was a conifer collector. Uh, it, it illustrates the many forms, colors, and textures of these plants with species that range from the Arctic all the way to the subtropics. The dogwood collection is best viewed uh, from mid-April to June, but it's very attractive with its uh, overlooks of the Anacostia River through the seasons and is a very peaceful uh, place to spend some time. For those who love native plants, uh, you'll make a, a beeline to Fern Valley, which has plants that are native both to the DC region as well as the entire Eastern United States. Taking a closer look at Fern Valley, you'll see year round interest there uh, in the winter time with these uh, lingering beech leaves. And then in the spring, beautiful wildflowers, ferns and uh, blooming hedges. And then later color and flowers of both shrubs and perennials as well as lovely fall foliage. A large section of this uh, Fern Valley is handicap accessible and it's uh, furnished with many rustic benches which uh, allow you to have comfortable seating. Moving on to some other special features of the Arboretum, there's the National Grove of State Trees. And this feature, features mostly the official state trees of all of our 50 states plus uh, Washington, uh, the District of Columbia. Unfortunately, a few of the trees, I believe those from Hawaii and uh, Alaska, the official state trees do not grow well here. So those states provided some other trees that are indigenous that do manage to grow well here. This is quite an extensive area. It spreads over 30 acres uh, with a lot of lawn. So an ideal place to picnic. A, a landscape feature that you see on the horizon there uh, these are the National Capital Columns, and they were created from stand, sandstone that was quarried in Virginia. These were originally installed on the east portico of the Capitol, but uh, the discovery was made that they were not strong enough to support the dome. They had to be removed, and this was the location they were moved to. There, uh, as you drive and walk on trails, there are many overlooks of the city. A few other features that I, I haven't mentioned in detail are collections of hollies and magnolias, a friendship garden, which was uh, recently redesigned, I believe in 2019. It features uh, some colorful perennials and grasses for uh, home landscapes. And there's also uh, near the entrance to Fern Valley is the Washington Youth Garden that provides hands-on gardening and nutrition activities for DC school children. And finally, we'll take a look at a, a very lovely public garden in Maryland. This is Brookside Gardens, which is part of Wheaton Regional Park. 
it uh, was built on a former uh, site of Stadler Nursery. And it now consists of 54 acres, partly wooded, and 32 acres of cultivated gardens. Many of these were uh, designed by landscape architect Hans Hanses, and he was very inspired by the concept of garden rooms from Longwood Gardens. Looking at those uh, formal beds that he originally designed back in 1969, uh, these are all linked by a flagstone walkway, many colorful beds, and they lead up the hill to a wedding gazebo. Then there are adjacent distinct garden rooms, a fragrance garden, a rose garden, and a trial garden where different combinations of plants are arranged uh, seasonally for different uh, color Brookside Gardens has two glass covered conservatories, the large O'Rourke greenhouse and the smaller Fritz greenhouse. The latter is the site of the annual Wings of Fancy exhibit. This uh, shows live butterflies and caterpillars. And then outside nearby is a butterfly garden to show you exactly what plants you'd want to include in your butterfly garden. Brookside has a number of naturalistic gardens. They're aquatic garden. You'll see uh, large perennials like uh, the ironweed pictured in the center there, uh, the mallows, lovely uh, shrubs of different types. There's also a large azalea garden with uh, specimen trees and lovely ground covers. There's quite an extensive garden called the Goody Garden that's honoring a prominent nurseryman. Uh, these, uh, he was especially fond of uh, these evergreen plants that are pictured in the right-hand picture. And this garden is designed in the Japanese style with a tea house on an island. Brookside uh, considers it very important to model sustainable gardening practices. And this is particularly well illustrated in their parking garden, where you'll see a, a wide variety of trees, shrubs, perennials, and grasses uh, accompanied by this permeable uh, paving. They have a lovely visitor center with a, a library classroom areas and a, a very appealing uh, bookshop and gift shop. They're also quite interested in uh, providing opportunities for both emotional and physical health for Maryland residents. So they have a labyrinth for meditation and a heart smart trail that uh, moves throughout the garden. Brookside Gardens has a virtual tour on their website and I strongly recommend looking into signing up for their annual Greenscape Symposium. It's held every year in February. Uh, for the last several years, they've been holding it uh, virtually via Zoom. And their catalog has uh, listings of many uh, a very appealing virtual and in-person classes. Uh, as I've mentioned, there are links that will take you directly from the handout to uh, various sections on our website pertaining to the gardens I've described. But should you want to get there directly, you would go to the Demo Gardens menu tab. And then I wanted to point out that uh, in the sidebar on our homepage, we have a little section called Regional Gardens. I have articles that I've written that go into much more detail about the gardens I've highlighted here, as well as some other gardens much further afield, uh, multiple articles on, uh, on uh, Longwood Gardens up in Pennsylvania, as well as Norfolk Botanical Gardens and gardens down in North Carolina. I'd like to quickly mention a couple of upcoming offerings. I'll remind you about this uh, event that's happening this weekend, the open house at both the Sunny and Cory Shade Demonstration Gardens, and then the Tuesdays at 10 events uh, that will be featuring Pollinator Month at Simpson Park Garden. And upcoming classes uh, via Zoom, uh, I'll be returning in a couple of weeks for a class on partnering with pollinators. Our extension agent, Kirsten Conrad, will teach a class on disease management in the vegetable garden in 
early July. And then I'll be back again to a partner with uh, Elizabeth Culleton, uh, a newly certified master gardener to tell you about climate conscious gardening. And you can register for those classes as you have for this one uh, on our website under the education menu tab. And uh, quickly, just to mention, uh, I'm sure you are, are also seeing this listed in the chat box. We have a help desk for answering your plant related questions, as well as plant clinics, uh, one at our Arlington Central Library and at a number of our uh, local farmers markets. Are there any questions about uh, either these uh, public gardens or any late questions on our demonstration gardens? Uh, sure, Elaine, we actually don't have any questions. I think what you have done is triggered a ton of inspiration for people <laughs> to visit all of these local gems and really get out there. This is a perfect presentation for the end of the school year, beginning of summer and fall, and really gives that, like if you look through the comments, it's like a lot of uh, people getting a game plan for what to do and what to visit over the next few months. Um, so I think I, uh, I'm definitely speaking for myself and I think I can speak for all of the participants that this was just a really well-researched, really just well done and informative, great presentation from you. Everyone seems to be very happy. Um, so thank you there. And then I would just remind everyone that this uh, presentation will be on, should be online in about two weeks. Um, as Elaine said, the, the help desk is open right now. You can always visit our website, ngnv.org to look for upcoming classes or other events. And um, yeah, thank you all very much. And many, many thanks again to Elaine for another wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, happy gardening in your own gardens. I hope uh, this has given you some ideas and inspiration. And I hope you have many hours of enjoyable visits, both in our demonstration gardens and, and these other public gardens in our area. Thank you.